topic for today is treasures in, I call it treasures in your backyard, use of local materials for pottery. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And the reason, well, I thought this would be interesting to, to look to talk about because there seems to be a growing interest in the use of local materials. I mean, we've, you know, when you think about it, traditionally, potters didn't have any of the freedom of choices that we had. Traditionally, to set up a pottery, you needed a water supply, you needed a fuel supply, because back then everything was burnt, you burned to fire everything, and you needed clay, whatever happened to be in the area. So if you even look at the history of, of pottery and the whole pottery industry and the pottery technology from the very beginning, is that the, the, the types of pottery that evolved across the, across the world were really dependent on the type of local clay. So for instance, around the Mediterranean, the whole Mediterranean region, most of what they had there was low fire red clay. So you evolved a lot, of, so you, you basically, this, this is where the Maiolica technique and, the, and a lot of the early pottery was, that's all they had. So they had to adapt, if they wanted to make pots, they had to adapt their, their, their production to whatever was available. Similarly, like in South China, they had high fire clays, which is one of the reasons that drove them to develop more efficient kilns, because they didn't have a lot of low fire clay in the southern part of China. The northern part of China, they had low fire clay, so they tended to work toward more low fire things. So, People were very dependent on the, whatever the local resources were in terms of coloration, pigment. They couldn't buy, like we can get, we can get cobalt oxide from Africa now, you know, and some of these other things that we can bring in, we don't even think much about it. But they were really limited in terms of whatever their local resources were, and that's what dictated what they were able to make. But I think, you know, I think now we're almost sort of going back the other way, and people are getting more and more, from what I've seen, people are getting more and more interested in, in understanding some of the natural materials and maybe introducing them in some of their work. And, you know, and I guess you could ask the question, you know, why use local materials? And I think, one of the, I think one of the reasons is there are a lot of people that feel like they want their work to connect to more have a direct connection to where they're living or their environment or something, their surroundings. And so, and so I think that's a big part of it is this almost emotional connection or, or, or you know, they want to sort of have some of the spirit of the local place. There's a great French, French phrase for that they use in cooking called cuisine de terroir, which means cooking of the dirt or literally cooking using local materials. So it's that same kind of spirit as you're sort of imbuing your work with, with the spirit or the connection to whatever's around you. Um, I think, and then there's also the idea of maybe you want to just, you know, you like the idea of just conserving materials. So if you can get a clay locally or a pigment locally, why not use it instead of buying something? Um, the other thing that I think we've, we've lost track of is some of the unique characteristics that you can get with naturally found materials that get homogenized out in commercial products. And there are a lot of, there are, there are some incredible clay bodies, naturally occurring clays and mixtures of clays that, have, that are, have incredibly good properties for a specific purpose. But we tend to use clay bodies and we think, and commercial clay bodies are really made, clay bodies basically a mixture of usually two or more clays plus other ingredients like fluxes and silica. But from the, from the commercial point of view, a clay company would like to make a clay body that is useful for everything because then they can sell the most of it. Instead of making 100 different clay bodies, they'd love it if they could make one clay body and everybody would buy that and just use that one. It's easier for them and it's cheaper. So they tend to make clay bodies that, have, that they think have broader areas of application, but then they lose a lot of their distinctiveness. They lose a lot of their sort of peculiarities that might not be good for everything, but might give you incredibly interesting results for some particular application. So one of the things that I've seen is that people are, are getting interested in using local materials to, to include the peculiarities of the materials if they can adapt them. This is another reason why a lot of potters, at least that I know, they make their own clay bodies. Because once you've if, you've, if you've gotten to the point where you've established a process that you like and a, and a form of work that you like and a color palette and so forth, then you can make a clay body that suits you, you can design your own clay body that suits your process much better than any commercial clay body, much better. Because, you're the, because also there's a certain amount of subjectivity to this. You're the one that's judging your work. You're the one that's judging how plastic you like it for whatever your process is. You're the one that's judging the color, and color is a really sensitive property. So what you might like, somebody else might not like. So by making your own clay body, you can exactly tune it in to your tastes and your style. And so a lot of potters that I know and, I've, and different places I've lived, 
eventually they end up making their own clay. And they may incorporate local materials if they have them available, or at least they're buying raw materials and producing their own mixtures. And because they can really fine to it. And then again, this is another really very personal expression of their own taste. It's part of their artistry. It's not just the object itself, it's the materials that it's made out of. And so some of those really subtle characteristics, they can fine tune them for their process, and you couldn't get them any other way. So they really value the fact that this is another expression of their personality, their taste, and the particular properties of the clay. And I think another part of it, I know one of my interests in materials is just sort of, I'm just interested in exploration and experimentation. I just love to try things. So whenever I'm driving along, if I see a, a, a rock or something, something, I'll swerve over and take my rock hammer and bang a piece off and bring it home and do something with it. And I just enjoy kind of experimenting and exploring. So that's another part of it too, is just kind of, I guess, curiosity, I'd say. What I'm gonna talk about is just you can, when I call local materials, you can sort of divide them up into, into, into a, several categories that we can sort of break them down. One I'd call rocks and minerals is one category. Another category I'm calling sort of scrap materials, um, not, not necessarily rocks and minerals. Another one I'm calling wastes, like organic and inorganic, and that include, might include like crop wastes and things like that. Plant materials, and finally commercial products, because there's some that are like wastes or scraps from commercial products. So I think I'm going to start with clay first um, in terms of local materials. And I guess the clay, clay can come from, there, there's clay found almost everywhere. I mean, you can, you can, people find it a lot of times. I've, I've talked to people, they just, they're working in their vegetable garden and they're planting in their garden and they'll, and they'll turn up some clay in their garden. You can find it very commonly in stream beds is a good place to look. Um, road cuts is another good place to look. You don't have to worry about going on private property just or, or excavation sites if they're accessible. It's a great place to look. Um, and then, of course, there are commercial brick pits, places where if you can get access to them, where you can actually, you know, where they're actually quarrying or they're mining clay. But they're, they're, there's clay found, and I'll show you later on, but I mean, I, we found some clay here in the backyard when we were constructing this building. We had to dig a trench from this building to the other building to connect a power line. And I found some really nice clay just in this tiny little trench. And I'll show you some examples of stuff that I did with it. So you can find it, you know, it's, it's avail, it's everywhere. The thing that's kind of interesting though, as you'll see as we go along is the condition of the clay that you find can vary tremendously. So it's not going it's almost never going to look like what you buy when you opened up the bag. Okay. It's going to have rocks and sticks and dead frogs and twigs and, and every, all kinds of other stuff in it. If you're lucky, you might find a vein or a bed of some, especially in a, in a cut or something of something that really looks like what you're more familiar with, with clay. But a lot of time it's just clay that's in this mixture of, of rocks and pebbles and sand and stuff. And the clay can be extracted, but it's not necessarily be something that you can just scoop a handful out and put it on the wheel and throw it. I mean, that happens, but, but it's, that's not, that's not in, in a lot of cases, that's not, the, that's not the normal situation. And so what can you do with clay? And I guess one of the things I want to talk about, even if you don't have access to something that you'd say is throwable, or you know, that you can even make a body out of, there's still a lot of other things you can do with it. Um, one thing you can do that I've played around a little with, it can be a, a clay body ingredient. You can, and so what this implies is you don't need an enormous quantity of this stuff to play with and experiment with. I mean, literally, I've got two five-gallon buckets that I got out of the trench here, just, you know, 50-foot trench, and I, yeah, that's, that's five years' supply, 10 years' supply for making slips and other things that you can do. So you don't need an enormous quantity. You don't need a dump truck and a backhoe, okay? Um, so one of the things you can do is, is you can add it, you, like you can just take a commercial clay that you have and take a little bit, and we'll talk more about the processing, but you can take a little bit of this native clay and just add it to it as a colorant, for example. And the, the, the other thing that's nice about, about some of these natural clays is they contain, a, for instance, a mixture of, of a lot of times iron minerals, but also other minerals. And when they're making commercial clays, for instance, and let's say they make a red earthenware or something, they're not adding all those other trace ingredients. They're adding like red iron oxide. So again, you can get some really unusual and subtle color variations by using even just the natural clay as the source of the colorant that you can't get in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the commercial, in the commercial, because they're just adding red iron oxide, pretty pure iron oxide. So, but, but some of these other might, might contain a, a, a whole lot of other, like especially manganese. Manganese is fairly common. So there might be traces of manganese in this clay that again would give you different color effects. And you'd have to play with it. You'd have to try different firings and different ways to see what might bring that out. But again, it, it, it gives you the, the possibility of, of greater variation. 
Um, you can also add it for texture. You might, have, you might find a clay, for instance, that let's say you found an earth, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about this later on, but I've taken an earthenware clay and added it to a high fire clay, and now I'm wood firing it. And when I fire it, the earthenware clay actually melts and oozes out of the other clay. And I get, and it almost looks like shigaraki. Everybody familiar with that, where the feldspar melts out? Only I've got red metallic things that ooze out of the clay and melt on the surface of the pot because the earthenware that I've added to, and, and yet and I fired it to cone 14 in a wood kiln. It's not, it doesn't affect the body, but it, it, gives, it gives this really dark, rusty stain and these things that just ooze out onto the surface, like sort of rusty shigaraki. The other thing you can do um, with, with, a, with a clay, well, again, we'll talk about processing in a minute here, but the other, another thing you can do is make a slip out of it. And this is probably the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, and as Greg mentioned earlier, the way I usually do this is I'll literally just, I'll, I'll, I'll just take the clay and only I don't bother with the freezing and thawing. I just put it in a bucket of water and let it sit and then I sort of beat it to death in the bucket of water and break it up. And then what I do is I let it, I let it, I'll just basically screen it. I'll just pass it through a series of screens. I'll pass it through a coarse screen to get out the pebbles and the dead frogs and the sticks and stuff. And then I'll pass it through a finer screen. And I made a couple of slips that I'll show you later that I, I finally ended up passing through an 80 mesh sieve and what I collected was basically slip. It was that, it was that simple. I just screened it, a, I, I, I mixed it around a couple of times. It's called blunging is the, is the term in the ceramics industry. Blunging, where you mix the clay with water. So I blunged the clay um, and then screened it to get out, the, and I just screened it successively finer, and I ended up with a usable slip. Because ba basically I was, I was removing all the coarse, gritty, chunky stuff, and I ended up with a very, in, in several cases, a very nice workable slip. And I mean, a lump like this will give you enough slip, you know, that'll give you a quarter slip. So again, you don't need a lot. If, if you, even if you're just digging in your backyard and you find a couple of little lumps of clay, that's enough to play with. You don't need an enormous quantity. Um, the other thing you can do with, with clay is you can, make it, you can use it as a stain. Um, and I've got this, I'll pass this around. This is a, a sculpture face that I did a while back and I had bisque fired it and then I just took the, the clay slip, which, I, which was dug from, this was dug from down in Bethesda. They were digging, they were doing excavation, and so I, I grabbed, they dug up some clay. And so I just brushed the slip right on the bist clay, and I knew that, and you say, well, the clay is gonna shrink and crack when it gets fired. I wanted that. I wanted this to look kind of old, so I wanted the, I didn't want it just to be a smooth surface. I wanted it to be kind of cracked when it shrank. So in this case, I just, and then I, so I brushed it on and then just wiped it off. So in this case, I was using the slip. Normally, you wouldn't put thick slip on a bisqueware because you had you know, the mismatch in terms of drain. But I wanted it to crack and, and maybe even fall off a little bit. So in this case, I used the slip as a stain, really, to highlight some of the texture on the piece. So that's another thing you can do with slips is they can just, you can dilute them, make washes and stains out of them, and they can just be a stain. OK? Any questions on that? So as far as, so going back to the preparation, one of the things, and a couple of the things in terms of evaluating, but preparation, again, what I normally do is if I find a lump of clay, like this is, this is the clay, for example, that came up out of our backyard right here. I can pass, I'll, I'll leave it up, well, I can pass it around, it's, on the, it's, in, the, it's in this container, it's a little, it, but you wouldn't necessarily look at this and say that that's clay, but there's a lot of clay in it. One of the tests that I found works really well if the clay is at all wet, or if I can wet it, is if I can smear it, if I can sort of burnish the clay while it's in the lump of clay, then I know that there's a fairly significant clay content. If it's got a lot of sand in it, you can't sort of polish or burnish the, the raw clay. But if it's got a, um, to me, what I would consider a usable clay content, I can usually take my stick or just a thumb and I can sort of burnish it and smear it. And I can see that, the, and that smearing is those really, really fine clay particles that are lining up again and I can produce that surface. But normally you wouldn't look at that and say, but that's, there's a lot of clay in that. There's all, there are also a lot of sand and gravel and pebbles and stuff in it, but there's a lot of clay in it. One of the things, another way if you want if you, to evaluate clay, let's say you just find some clay and you want to decide what it's good for, would be do a fusion test. Take a little, take a little piece of, um, of uh, you know, bisqueware or something and make a little pile on it or if you want to make a little dish or something like this out of clay and fire it and see what it does. Because if it's earthenware and you fire it to cone six, it'll melt. So part of, part of you maybe depending on what you want to do with the clay, you might say, well, yeah, I'd like to put it in my clay body, but I want to know what it's going to do. Or I'd like to fire it to cone 10, but I want to know what it's going to do. So do a little firing, do a fusion test or a melt test and see what happens to the clay. Does it come through the firing basically unchanged? In which case it would tell you, you know, this is like a stoneware or a high fire clay. Or does it melt? In which case it's an earthenware clay. 
And so you might, if you wanted to add it to your clay body then, and it melted, you'd say, well, then I better not add too much to my clay body because my whole clay body will start slumping. So I could add a little bit maybe if it was a red clay for color, but I can't add a lot because my whole clay body will slump. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. So that's another good, sim really simple screening test is just fire a little bit of it and see what it does. Also, it'll tell you whether what it changes color. Because the, the, in the discussion earlier, the question came up about clays, or the issue came up about clays changing color. And a lot of naturally occurring clays, naturally, contain a lot of organic residues, which typically burn off. And the classic example of that, and you may even see that in, if, you buy, if you buy raw materials, like ball clay is typically gray very commonly gray, and yet almost all of that is carbon. And so when you, when you fire a ball clay, it'll usually come out cream colored or gray or white. So you can't judge the color of the clay, the fired color necess necessarily from the raw clay color, because a lot of it may be organics or something that's gonna change or something that's gonna burn off. Okay? And even the iron, if there's iron in the clay, the iron will change color. If you have a clay that looks yellow, for sort of mu typical mustard yellow to start, Chances are when you fire it in air, that's gonna come out red because that's just a different form of iron oxide. When you fire it, it's gonna change to red iron oxide and if you fire it in reduction, it's gonna go black. So again, so do a firing test. If you're interested in using it as a pigment, then you know, take, do, get an early idea about what's actually gonna happen to the clay for your intended use. Okay, um, I'm trying to think if I had something. Oh, in terms of, and I guess in terms of slip, one of the things I wanted to mention was when you're making a slip and you're applying it, one of the things you don't want to have, I've got some dark slip here, one of the things you don't want to have is you don't want to have a lot of coarse particles on the slip. And the best way to judge that is to eat, um, is, is, okay? Because you, you can feel it with your teeth, okay? So you get some of the slip and before you brush it on, just taste some of the slip. No, I'm kidding, this is chocolate syrup. <laughs> but, 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 the, <laughs> but, the, but the point I was making is that, <laughs> the point I was making was that you do want to, depending on the use you're going to do with the slip, you do want to, you can do it, you don't have to eat it, you can feel it. You don't want a lot of, of grit in the clay, especially if you're going to burnish it, because you, you'll never burnish, you'll never be able to burnish the slip even if it has, if it has any, any noticeable grit in it. You'll, it'll just, it'll, you'll just be scrubbing the grit across the surface. So you really do, and I'm, I'm sort of kidding, but I'm not completely, because as a geologist, this is the way we used to ju judge the rocks in the field. You'd bite a piece off and you'd chew it. And you could feel the way it broke down as to you could judge the particle size and stuff. But you don't have to do that. Because I've gone through three sets of teeth. Um, or no teeth. Or no, yeah. But, but you do want to make sure that, it, that if you're thinking about burnishing it, that it doesn't have any really fine grit in it. And I mean, really, really fine, because that's all it will take will be to destroy. You'll never get, you'll sit there and try to polish forever, burn, and it'll never happen if it's got any of that fine grit. And the one thing that's always interested me about clay is, to me at least, the single most sensitive property that we see when we make things out of clay, you know what it is? What property is the most sensitive to tiny little changes in the chemistry of the clay or the glazes? The color, the color, is that mechanical properties and plasticity and all of that stuff is far outweighed. Color is incredibly sensitive to small changes in composition. So this is one of the, this is one of the arguments in favor of, of using natural materials that you might get a subtly different shade, let's say of red or brown, by using a natural clay to give you a color than you would by using pure iron oxide. Now maybe that's not important, but it, it's, it's an opportunity or possibility. And certain clays contain significant, significant amounts of some of these secondary elements, and you can get some really unusual effects. 
that, and what you'd have to do to duplicate it, if you wanted to, you'd have to go back and have it chemically analyzed to find out what it is, to say, okay, how much iron do I add, and how much chromium, and how much manganese? This is naturally occurring. And again, you've, you know, you've got all the advantages that we've talked about. You're connecting it to your area. So, so you, might get, you might be able to produce pottery that's really unique, not just because it's in, it embodies your style, but it embodies, it incorporates your area. And it's really, it re represents you as a potter and your, and your location. So that's, that's, that's the argument anyway in favor of it. Let's move on to, um, and I, I'm gonna t come back. I, some of these things that I've got up here, I suggest if you wanna come up and look at them later, because instead of passing a lot of stuff around, I left them up here to look at. And I've got examples of some glazes made from rocks, several different glazes made from clays, a couple of things I'll pay. Oh, let me, well, I'll, and I'll get to this. So you're welcome to look at these. This is, matter of fact, as long as I talked about it already, this is the slip made from the clay that I dug up out of our backyard. So this was fired a cone 10 reduction in our gas kiln. And this, this clay, this was the color bisque, when it was fired in reduction, came out dark brown to black. And I, I, got, I got a quart of slip from about two pieces this size. And I wanted to try it, so, I, and it, so this, was, this was cone 10. I've got a, some other slip I'll show you that I fired it at cone six and some other fired it at earthenware, but this was cone 10 reduction. And it's just this, the glaze over it is just a celadon. Okay, rocks. Um, well, there are all different kinds of rocks around. There's granite, there's limestone and dolomite, and these are you know, either things that you can find around here. One of the things I'd suggest, if you're interested in rocks but you don't know much about them, if it's a dark colored rock, it probably might give you more interesting results than a light colored rock. Because if you, aside from all the melting characteristics, but if you're interested in getting some colors or something out of it, more likely the minerals that are in a dark colored rock are gonna contain, again, the same kind of minerals like iron, manganese, chromium. And so you might, you might get more interesting results from a dark colored rock than a light colored rock. Um, so some of the dark colored rocks are basalt. They're right, I was telling Jenna a while back, right here on 340, if you, just before you cross Catoctin Creek, there are, well, even right up on the road here, just on the other side of the road, there are two kinds of volcanic lava side by side in a road cut. And one of them is basalt. And basalt is a really, this is the, the, the kind of, you heard about the, like the volcanic eruptions in Hawaii, that's basalt. And so we've got some right here in Maryland when there used to be volcanoes here. And that's a really nice glaze ingredient because it contains a lot of highly colored dark minerals and it makes a great glaze ingredient as an example. Um, but one of the things I guess I wanted to mention when you think, now rocks, rocks, is different than, rocks are different than clay because you think about, well, how am I going to convert this, this rock into something I can use in a glaze? And the problem is unless you've got a ball mill and you've, unless you've got some crushing equipment, it's really laborious. You know, I've ground some rocks in mortars and pestles. I got a mortar and pestle in, in home, one of the home decorating stores. It was a rock, carved out of a rock. It's about this big. I was going to bring it in, but it weighs about 25 pounds, so I decided against it. But you can do a lot, some hand grinding, but you'll never be able to make enough stuff to do anything, you know, reasonable with. So, and, and, and so that's one aspect of it. The other thing is some rocks aren't worth using. Like, there's a lot of limestone around here, but... And limestone is whiting, you know, that's the glaze ingredient. But is there any point in, unless you're really attached to local rocks, is there any point in going through all the labor of grinding up limestone when you can just buy whiting? I don't know, there's a lot of, but the thing you can do is, if you, you know, if you don't mind this sort of detour out of purely digging it out of the ground yourself, you might be able to buy the lime that they sell to put on your lawn and it's quarried locally. And they do the grinding for you. And when you, if you buy lawn lime, or what they call dolomitic lime to put on your lawn, that's just ground limestone. And so if you can find a place in your area that sells locally made lime, then that is your local limestone. It's just they've done all the grinding for you. But, I mean, again, and there's, there's a, there are a lot of different kinds of limestone around it. What's really interesting is right down the road here on, on, in Millville, there was a quarry um, where they dug, where, where almost, almost theoretically pure dolomite was quarried, and it was incredibly valuable to the steel making industry, and they used to ship it right down the road here to Pittsburgh. It was incredibly valuable raw material because it was very, very pure dolomite, which was very unusual, actually. It wasn't just dolomitic limestone, it was very pure dolomite, and it was considered very valuable. Um, and and they're, they're, so they're all the, they're, but there's a lot of limestone around here. Um, and it's quarried, but, but again, is it worth you grinding it up? I don't know, you know, if you, if you like doing something like that. But you might be able to find a, a, a source in the region, at least, that sells, that, that does the grinding for you, and then you could use it. 
But what can you do with rocks? Well, one of the things that one way to, to use them possibly would be, or to, to be able to have access to them, is if you can get a powder. And I, I was really fortunate. I lived in Maine for a while, and I had a shop on an, on an island, um, Vinyl Haven Island, which is in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Maine. Well, there's an ancient granite quarry there. And they had reopened, and a lot of the granite from Vinyl Haven Island was used in the Capitol buildings down in Washington. Um, but they had reopened the quarry and they were cutting the granite with, with saws. And so I got the saw dust, the granite <laughs> dust from the granite quarry. And they, they were glad to get rid of it because they had to, it was like sludge. They had to pay to get rid of it. So I said, I'll take it. So I made, you can look, so the, I've got them up here. You can look at it. This was the granite that they were cutting. And I made these two glazes from the granite dust. So I didn't have to do any grinding. I got this really nice, fine powdered granite. So as an alternative or something sort of related to that is go to companies that, that, that prepare monuments, like, funerary, like, like graveyard monuments or, or places that are cutting countertops and see if, they, and see if you can get the sludge, because they don't, they don't want it either, is that they're using diamond saws to cut it. So it's, you don't have to do any grinding, it's just ready to use. So if you can go, you know, go talk to countertop places and go talk to a monument, monument grinding where they do sandblasting and, and, and collect and see if you can collect the dust. Because a lot of times they just want to get rid of it. So then you don't have to do any of the grinding. Now the other alternative is sometimes you can find areas where the rocks have naturally kind of broken down and decomposed. They, they, they weather. And there's a, again, there's a good example right over here on 340. This is, this is, one, of the, this is one of the kinds of, this is basalt. Or well, this is actually it's called metabasalt because it's been metamorphosed. But I also found in the same outcrop, there was an area where the rock had cracked and it had broken and it had been weathered and water had been running through it. And so it turned into that. So, same, so I collected, I've got a, a bucket of this stuff. So this stuff, I'll be able to grind this up. Almost, I can almost just crush it with my fingers and I'll be able to use. Uh, it, and now the chemistry may have changed a little bit because it did weather but it's probably still pretty close. So I'm gonna play around with this as a glaze ingredient, and I think it'll give me something close to this. Um, but I'll, I'll pass these around just so you can see the difference. So this, is, this was weathered, and there was a band about an, an inch and an inch and a half wide in the middle where this had gotten crushed and weathered, and the water had run through it, so it had broken down the rock. So I don't have to grind this up, I can just crush this a little bit. This'll be easy to do. Um, so that's another thing to look at. I'll pass this around if you wanna look at it, see the difference, is that a lot of times, if you, if you find an area where there are exposed rocks, you'll find an area where the rock has been weathered and broken down, and it's a lot more powdery and a lot more, more usable than just this really hard rock. That's another, that's another thing you can do. So, yeah, so that, so that you can sometimes, you can find rocks that, where in, the, in, in their naturally occurrence, where the rock has kind of broken down and weathered, um, and there, there are several examples around here where the rock itself is really hard and durable, but you can find portions where it's gotten crushed and weathered naturally, and you can almost just dig it out with your hands. So it's a lot closer to being usable than, than you know, trying to you know, dynamite it into small pieces. One of the things I suggest that I mentioned earlier with clays, I also suggest doing with the, the rock, is, is do a fusion test, do a melt test. Because if you're gonna use it, be nice, even if you don't know exactly what it is, is to find out, well, where does, does it melt if you fire it to whatever temperature and, 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 or not? So this is, I'll pass this around. This is a sample of basalt in a little dish that I made. I, this is reduction fired, because I also wanted to see the color, that was fired to cone 10. It totally melted at cone 10. This, <coughs> basalt, this is basalt. This is another sample of a schist that was from around here. Um, and this didn't melt completely. You can see it partially melted, but it didn't melt it. So this tells me if I want to use this, let's say I want to use it as a glaze ingredient. It, it helps me to know that, okay, the basalt completely melted. I'm not gonna have to do a whole lot in terms of adding other things to it to turn that into a glaze. Because by itself, it's almost forming a glaze. Whereas this one, I'm gonna have to do more. I'm gonna have to add some fluxes or something to it. So even if you don't know what it is, this can give you a big clue. And, and another kind of, but another kind of, if you don't think about it as a rock, but I include it in this section, is volcanic ash. And volcanic ash is basically, I mean, you, if, you, if you have access, like if, if you can go out and, are you gonna be anywhere? Uh, Anywhere, like if you're anywhere near, like when you know when the when the we had the um, the, the eruption out west. What was the, what was the volcano that erupted? Mount St. Mount St. Mount St. Helens. So if you have Mount St. Helens ash, you can make a glaze out because Mount St. Helens ash is almost the same composition as granite, and it's a fine powder. So it wouldn't take a lot of work to grind it up to make it usable, or in, in some cases, if you had enough of it, you could probably just screen it and take the finer stuff and use that as your glaze ingredient. So volcanic ash from anywhere, just about, is a really usable, is a usable glaze ingredient.
And it is, it's just, it's just a finely divided rock. Depending on the kind of, it might, be, it might be a basalt kind of ash, or it might be more like a granite composition, but it's basically the same as either basalt or granite. So it could make a really good glaze addition. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else I had here. Anyway, so, yeah, so the main thing I suggest with the rocks is um, either if you can, unless you have access to do a lot of grinding and powdering, is, is see if you can find forms of the rocks that are already kind of rotten or broken down and then you're well along the way to making them usable, like the rotten rocks. Um, or um, you can see how powdery that, how flaky that stuff is. You can just see it. yeah, it's like it's like different. it's like sitting there crunching styrofoam, pop, you know, popping the styrofoam balls. You know, yeah. Somebody take that away from her. <laughs> <laughs> we know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time. So if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on The Potter's Roundtable. <laughs>